The United States Thanksgiving holiday is traditionally stated to have started in the small Plymouth colony in 1621, where some English pilgrims feasted, gave thanks with some members of the Wapana Indian tribe who brought, I guess the best way of saying it is they brought gifts of food as a gesture of goodwill. There's a lot more to the story, but I know you know more about it than I'm stating here. We also are aware that the custom grew in various colonies, colonies as a means of giving thanks in the celebration of the fall harvest. Then in 1777, over 150 years later, the Continental Congress proclaimed, proclaimed a federal, a national federal day of Thanksgiving, a single day event after the American Revolution victory at the Battle of Saratoga. Then it was 12 years later, 1798, when then newly earlier that year elected president uh, George Washington proclaimed another national day of thanksgiving in honor of the ratification of the constitution and he requested that the congress finally make it an annual event they declined it was almost a hundred years later before president uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1683, 1863, yes, in order to boost the morale of the Union because of the revolution, because of the war between the states was going on, that he proclaimed the last Thursday in November of each year to be a Thanksgiving holiday, and then as the saying, and the rest is history. And then it became an official U.S. federal holiday on December the 26th, 1941, as the fourth Thursday in Thanksgiving, I mean, the fourth Thursday in November, as it is today. So, brother, I think that we would probably all certainly want to agree that like the early settlers, we should be grateful for our blessings and being mindful of the one from whom they come. So with Thanksgiving being this coming Thursday, I'd like for us to take a, a look at the topic of being thankful. I have entitled this sermon, thankfulness, thankfulness. So today, let's take a, and I'm, I'm, I'm stating this as a somewhat casual look for what we could be thankful for both spiritually and physically, and I'm seeing a casual look at it from the point of view of because we're not going into any great detail from the point of view because there are dozens and dozens of different passages on any point that we're going to take a look at, but we're just kind of looking at some of them because we're wanting for us to realize how thankful are we? How thankful should we be? And so let's get started and let's take a look at some things, some that we can be thankful for of a physical nature. You know, things like food, clothing, shelter, we'll at least look at those things. And so let's start off by looking at being thankful for food. First of all, I want us to understand there are multiple, multiple passages showing giving thanks to God for food. We're going to read some, not anywhere close to all of them, but some of them we are going to read. So let's go to John 6 and verse 11 to start with. John 6 verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, you know this, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to his disciples, and the disciples 
to them that were set down and likewise of the fish and as much as they would. So he took it and he blessed it is what we're looking at. Let's go to another one in Acts 27, beginning in verse 20, uh, 33. Acts 27, 33. <clears throat> and while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This is the 14th day that we have, that we have tarried and continued fasting, heaven taking nothing. 14 days of fasting. Continue on. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broke it, he began to eat. Then were all of good cheer, I would think so. And they also took some meat. First Timothy 4, beginning in verse 1. First Timothy 4, verse 1. The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. In the latter days. This is our time. Verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from, from, uh, from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So he tells us that we're to be thankful for them. We're to, if you're believing, you know the truth, and we're to be thankful for what God is giving to us. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Now, he clarifies that because some get, some get bent out of shape here in saying, for nothing is to be refused. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. That means we can eat any old thing. Well, he clarifies it in the very next verse, and he says, for it is sanctified, it is set apart by the word of God in prayer. And you have to go to the word of God to find out what he says that we can and cannot eat. But all that he has set apart for us to eat, that's really clear what it is saying. The English doesn't do it justice. But anyway, so we're to give it, we're to take it, to eat what he has given to us through thanksgiving, thanking God for it. Now, I'm going to ask that you allow me here, I, I realize I'm speaking so I can do this, but to pause here and to ask, we're dealing with the topic of being thankful for the food that, that God gives to us. Should we be offering prayers to God before our meals? The answer is absolutely yes. And to follow up with, with that, a question is, and why not? I mean, why would we not do it? Why would we not even, why, why is this even a question that we would be asking? Well, I came up with, when I came up with this question, I came up with the list. I started writing a list and I wrote a long list of why we should be praying and praising God prior to any meal, let me offer two on my list. Just two. The list is long, but I'm going to just do two. The first one, number one, I have is to acknowledge God. Now, what I mean that by that is as we begin a meal, we need to praise and thank God, acknowledging that he is God, and we know we are not you may have gone to the grocery you may have bought the, the food, you may have gone to a job earned money then took the money and went down to the grocery store and bought the food and brought it home or you or somebody in your house who cooked the food and you ate it uh where did it really all come from it all came from god it all comes from god and we know that he is god 
and we are not. And so we acknowledge that he is the one who has provided it all. Go with me to James 1 and verse 17. James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And brethren, I, I, I personally believe, and I hope you do too, that the sooner we come to realize it and then acknowledge it, the better off we are that when we state that we know he is the one who provides all of it. Yes, all of it. This is what in biblical terms is called the biblical doctrine of providence. All comes from God. Everything comes from him. Doesn't make any difference what kind of job you do, what kind of money you go, what kind of food you purchase, how, all of that. It all comes from God, meaning simply that everything comes from our, from our heavenly father's hands. And yes, the food we eat clearly falls into this category. There's much more to this, but let's go to point number two. I said I did a long list. This is the second one. The second one is to be humbled. Now, what I mean by that is because I think most people, you probably would agree, it is hard and it is humbling to say thank you. Yet as believers, hopefully, we understand that our priority is reflecting Jesus in our lives, and he certainly modeled humility as well as thankfulness for us. So let's read some passages along this, along this line. Go with me to Philippians 2, Philippians 2, verse 3, Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we, so he modeled it for us. He modeled this example of thankfulness, thanksgiving, and humility for us. But I want us to continue on here who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but was, but made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself is what it literally would mean and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So, brethren, please realize, for us to pause and to thank God is to admit that we are not God, the provider he is. And that in itself is an act of humility. We thank him for it. That's an act of humility. We acknowledge that he's the one who's provided all of it. That's an act of humility, and it's an act of thankfulness. So please understand, by pausing and praying, thanking God prior to a meal, understand that we are interrupting our nothing life compared to his when we think we are so self-sufficient on our own and we humble ourselves before him to tell him thank you. So yes, I do believe that I can make a case that we need to pause and thank God before we have any food that we drink. It's a custom of the Orthodox Jews, and I'm not saying that we do this because the Orthodox Jews do it, but I'm saying I just want you to be aware. I don't know if you've ever been around very many Jewish people, but they go to a water fountain and they'll turn the water on <laughs> You know, we, we, we thirst, we go up to a water fountain. What do you do? You turn the water on, you put your head down and you drink, right? They go up to the water fountain. They turn the water on and they pause before they drink. And they thank God for the water they're about to have. They're acknowledging 
Everything comes from him. And here's the thing. We pause and we thank God before all of our meals, whether we are eating it with others or whether we are eating it by ourselves. Why would we not? Therefore, with each meal, I think that we should be reminded of God's loving kindness. And therefore, as a result, we offer up to our awesome and loving Father praise and thanksgiving before any and every meal that we do. Or does it embarrass us to do so? Doesn't have to be a big show. We just need to do it. The next one is for clothing. And there's many other scriptures that we could read that we're not. So let's go for it. Clothing. Go with me to Matthew 6, verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. This is all part of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink nor yet for your body what you shall put on it. Is it not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Clothing. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto your statue? Or why take you thought for clothing, raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They toil not. In other words, they don't work for it. They just are, because God did this. Neither do they spin. In other words, they don't make the clothing. They don't make anything for, you know, for their, to put it on themselves in this silly analogy in one sense but we get the point and yet i say unto you that even solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these wherefore if god shall clothe the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven shall he not much more clothe you O you of little faith therefore take not no thought saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or whether shall we be clothed for for all these things do the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things but seek you first this is the context see we go to this first often but we don't always read it in the context of what the what the real context is but seek you first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you and in verse 34 take therefore no thought for the morrow for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof god's in charge he's going to take care of us yeah and some are going to have more wherewithal to to come up with more monies for buying different clothing but we're clothed and it all comes from god and then the the, the third one is of course i said is food clothing and shelter and so the third one is shelter isaiah 40 isaiah 4 verse 6 isaiah 40 verse 6 niv translation it will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain. See, shelter doesn't always have to mean the roof over your head. There's other things in scriptures that also are shelter. Let's go on. Psalm 9, verse 9. Psalm 9, verse 9. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Psalm 91 and verse 1. Psalm 91, verse 1. New International Version. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I have a little story I want to mention, a little illustration here. 
there was a man who was interested in selling the house. And so we called a real estate agent and said, I want to sell my house. So what do I do? Well, so the real estate agent said, well, the first thing to do is make a list of all the, of all the things uh, that the house has to offer. And, and then we'll talk about it. And so days go by and nothing happens and nothing happens. So the agent finally calls the person back and he said, I thought you wanted to sell your house. And he said, well, I did. And he said, but when I made up the list of all that my house has to offer, I decided it was the perfect place for me. <laughs> that is so true. Anyway, now, I sort of like told you that to tell you this, because I, I, I want to tell you, I use this principle. I've known this little story. I mean, many of you have for many years. And there was, and I've only used this one time in my ministry that I can remember, but I do remember one time doing this. I used this principle from here when a Church of God member stated he wanted to divorce his wife, a non-member. So I'd ask him to write up the positive qualities about his life. And then he did, and he got back in touch with me. And then he said uh, I, he no longer wanted to divorce his wife. Then, this is a true story. Then he tells me that he also, a stop, that he also had stopped the affair that he was involved in. Who knew? <laughs> Who you know, it's like, wow, there's a lot of qualities. I mean, so anyway, it's it's a true story. Okay, another one, still looking at things under the physical that we can be appreciative for. And this isn't this was for all of us. The food, the clothing, the shelter, all of that is for all of us. And the next one I have is for our families. And I want to have this in two two points. The first one is, is for our children. Go with me to Psalm 127, verse 3. Psalm 127, verse 3. Lo, children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. Now, that's a Hebrewism, and maybe somebody can do can cover this on a sermon. That sometimes because it's really an interesting thing. We read it and we go, "Oh, okay, they can." You know, well, what is it talking about? Well, it's interesting. Go to Isaiah fifty-nine, verse twenty-one, for the next passage here. Isaiah fifty-nine, verse twenty-one. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord: my spirit that is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, meaning your children, nor out of the mouth of your seed seed or your grandchildren, saith the Lord, from henceforth, even forever. So we're passing on blessings. We are as parents to pass on blessings to our children and even on to our grandchildren, the word of God. And we should be thankful that we know the word of God and that we have these children and these grandchildren and we can pass these on to them. And then the second one is number two is for our parents. Now, many of us, I know in this congregation, our parents are no longer with us. Some, of, some have parents and some don't. But so our second one point under families here is just for our parents. So go with me to Philippians 6 and verse 1. Philippians 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Huh. Now, one of these things we're passing on to our children, the word of God, the word is not, to, is not to depart out of our mouth, we're to pass it on to our children and to our children's children. This is something we're to be passing on to them. Then read verse four. 
And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nourish and admonition of the Lord. So there's the command that we're to do just that. We're to pass on the word of God to them. We're thankful that we have them. We're thankful that we have the word of God. And we're thankful even that God has given us instructions that we're to pass this on to our children and grandchildren. I think all of us can certainly think about all the things that parents do and have done for their children, all that they did for us. Uh, we're all adults. Uh, we don't have any small children that, that are in part of this congregation locally here. But the thing is, all too often, all their love and their care and their providing for, their provision of taking care, their are simply taken for granted. And here's the point that I'm making in saying this. Children should repay their parents. Now, let me show you what I mean. Go with me to 1 Timothy 4. I mean, 1 Timothy 5, verse 4. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 4. And I'm going to read this from the Amplified uh, Bible which is also closely related very closely to the NIV and at least three other translations all have the same similar wording. This is 1 Timothy 5 verse 4. But if a widow has children or grandchildren who are adults, see to it that these first learn to show great respect to their own family as their religious duty and natural obligation and to recompense their parents or grandparents for their upbringing. For this is acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God. And I know so many people will say, I don't know, I don't, I don't know anything to my parents. They did what they did, and I don't owe them anything. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. And we're looking at things to be thankful for. We're to be thankful for our parents. We're to be thankful for our children. We're thankful for our parents. And all that these things that we've talked about. Okay, let's, let's go on. Another point to be thankful for is for all things. For all things. Ephesians 5, verse 20. Ephesians 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 5 18. First Thessalonians 5 18. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So it's not just so in, in uh, Philippians, I mean in uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 20, it's not just a good idea. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 basically says, it's, this, is, this is the will of God. This is what God wants us to do. Because we remember, we read the verse earlier back in James 1, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So we need to remember all things come from God. All things come from God. And as a result of just these few things that we've mentioned here, brethren, we should have an attitude of, this is a catchy catchphrase, we should have an attitude of gratitude. We should be in a thankful attitude toward God for all of these things. Now, I mentioned in announcements about this automobile accident that my grandson and this, this young girl, the date that he was with, we're in this horrible accident. A miracle occurred, and I am so thankful. I'm thankful for my grandson, but I'm also very thankful that they're both still alive because God protected them in a, in a horrible situation. And so this is an attitude of gratitude, and I, and I, uh, it's something that we should always have on the forefront of our mind and very front to our thinking. Now, I want to give you one other interesting illustration or example. Uh, 
uh, especially considering thankfulness. Now, I'm going to tell you, I found this off the internet as I'm looking, researching thankfulness and Thanksgiving and all of those kinds of things, putting us all together. And I thought when I ran across it, I thought, this is really interesting. Now, I'm not, I'm not backing it up that it's 100% true. It's 100% true that I'm reading 100% what, what I read on the internet, but we'll leave it at that. But anyway, I still thought it might be helpful for us with our attitude of appreciation or gratitude or thankfulness. It was written for the purpose to show what would happen to the average American family if they suddenly, their income is certainly reduced to the annual income salary of over one half of the world population. Now, we live in a country, unless you've actually researched this, you have no clue. This is going to be totally new unless you've done this before. It says, and I'm going to read this, and I'm, I've, this is exactly the way it was written. Take away the furniture, saving a few old blankets, kitchen table, and one chair. Take away all the clothing except the oldest dress or suit a shirt, blouse, and one pair of shoes for the head of the family. Not asking for comments, but how many pair of shoes do any of us have? Empty the cup, cupboards of food with the exception of a small bag of flour, some sugar, salt, a few molded potatoes, a handful of onions, and a dish of fried beans, dismantle the bathroom, shut off the water, and remove the electrical wiring. Exchange all automobiles for one bicycle, take away the house itself, and move the family into a tool shed. Now, just going to stop here. I know a family that was in a situation uh, where they wound up living in a tool shed for a while because that's what they're and this is in the united states cancel all subscriptions to newspapers magazine book clubs put the nearest clinic or hospital 100 miles away and put a midwife in charge instead of a doctor discard the bank account stock certificates pension plans insurance policies and leave the family five dollars in cash Give the head of the family a few acres to cultivate, to grow food for the family, where one third of it goes to the landlord. Over half of the world population, that's their life. Now, I have one more under the physical. Brother, let us be truly thankful for all the ways that we are blessed in this country. It's not all perfect. You may say a whole lot of it is not perfect. We could go back and read what we just read or we can have an attitude of thankfulness and gratitude for the country in which we live. Okay, now let's look at some, some things that we can be thankful for on a spiritual nature. First and foremost, for salvation. I'm sure we all are aware of this we talk about salvation and something like this immediately comes to the forefront of our thinking that we would all be lost if we did not have god's grace we need to be thankful for the redemption that is provided through jesus life and death second corinthians 9 verse 15 second corinthians 9 15 Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Romans 6, verse 17. Romans 6, 17. 
But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And we have to understand that. We didn't come up with it. It was delivered to us. It was given to us for us to be able to know and to understand this is sin, this is not, and you have a choice. Which one do you want to live? Remember, I read that all physical things are where families live in and half of, in over half of the world. Most all of those have no clue about sin and death and the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And I'm reading these verses for us all to come to the community, but put it out there in the front. Are we thankful for these things? And the question is, is it's either yes or it's no. It's not a well, sort of, that's a no. It's a yes or it's not. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. From the beginning, we were set aside to receive this. Oh, how thankful we should be. Verse 14, wherein too he called you <clears throat> by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have one more under this um, section here. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a prayer of thanksgiving, actually, from David. <clears throat> and I think it is appropriate for us to look at and consider today. It's in 1 Chronicles 16. 1 Chronicles 16, beginning in verse 34. 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And you say, save us, O oh God, for our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, and we may give thanks to his holy name, and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. He put it out there. David put it out there and told the people, We're going to thank, we're going to have this attitude of thanking God. Or we're not. And he put it out there and the people said, amen, I agree with it. And they praise God. Thank God. The next point under the physical is for being called by God, our father. And this is not a, this is not a little point. This is a big deal. Whenever we really think about it in the whole scheme of things. John 6, 44, John 6, 44, no man can come to me, the me is Jesus, except the father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. <clears throat> that is a big deal to understand that who called us? God, the father. God, the father called us, brought us to Jesus turned us over to him for Jesus to work with us, to bring us to the place of salvation, sanctification, justification, all of those things before God. And he's done it. Another, another point under the spiritual, for the victory that is in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. The sin of death is sin, <clears throat> and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God. Do we give God? How often do we thank God for the victory that we have through Jesus Christ? Brother, in every prayer, 
Let us give thanks to God for salvation that he gave to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And every one of these, we can stop and ask, do we? It's not a should we. I'm showing we should. The question is, is do we? Then the next point is for God's care and leadership. For God's care and this is looking at things from a spiritual level for which we can be thanked that we can give thanks for God's care and leadership. Brethren, please understand, once we have started down this road toward obtaining salvation, in other words, he, he called us way back from the foundation, of, you know, predestined us to be part of this calling. We could have said no. But for some reason, he, he kept working with us, kept working with us, kept working with us until we are saying yes. And so we're just trying to point out things that we can be truly thankful for. So once we start down that road, God continues to care for us and provide us with leadership. In other words, he's in charge of our lives. He is the one that's in charge of our lives. And do we know this? And are we thankful for that? First Peter 5, verse 7. First Peter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Philippians 4, verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known, be known unto God. Be careful for nothing in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. For the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Are we thankful for this point of knowledge? It's the scripture. It's there. We can count on it. Are we thankful for it? Go with me to Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation or your conduct <clears throat> be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We go back to this physical thing, you know, the food, the clothing, and the shelter. And I used to point, I said, some people have more cash, more monies and they're able to buy nicer clothes well okay that's great that's wonderful but this tells us and he says be content with such as you have because he has said i will never leave you nor forsake you are we thankful for that so it goes back and it shows us for all of these physical things that we're thankful for and well i don't have as much as somebody else has well uh that's not the point. God is, not, Jesus, God the Father through Jesus Christ is not going to leave us so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We could put in. So you're ridiculed for not having the kind of card that others have. You're ridiculed for not having the kind of clothing that others have. You're ridiculed for not having the nicest house that others have. You have Jesus Christ. We have God the Father, leaders caring for, leading us, taking care of us. Because you see, brethren, God continues to show his care and leadership in our lives, so let us be therefore thankful. Another point for being able to call God our Father. We know Matthew 6, verse 9, disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. That's actually in Luke. But in Matthew six and verse nine he says so when you pray you pray our father which are in heaven our father way 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 the majority of the people who live on the face of the earth 
They can't do that. Because they're not yet called. We can be thankful for this. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, making it personal, personal. He is my Father. He is our Father. God, Jesus is our older brother. And then another point, this is still under the spiritual. Be thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Mark 10, 28. Eight, Mark 10, 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or brother or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. Yes, with persecutions. I read in the word yes, because it doesn't say that here, but that's what it says. And in the world to come, eternal life. <laughs> Paul set the example for giving thanks. He calls it for all saints, brothers and sisters, for all of them, every one of them. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Colossians 1 verse 3, Colossians 1 verse 3, we give thanks to God and the Father for our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you and i have others I'm, I'm going to skip some in fact i have in my notes here i noticed i have 10 others that we're not going to read and there are dozens others that i don't even have in my notes i mean there's that much on all of these topics here So, brother, with just what we've seen, and like I said, there are many other points and there are many other scriptures on just the points we did look at. Let me conclude with reading these additional scriptures here. So go with me to Psalm 103, Psalm 103, verse 1, we begin. Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. This is thankfulness. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Huh. Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. And we wonder what to be thankful for. Wow. Colossians 3, verse 15. Colossians 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be you thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him make your own list i i told you i made a list i came up with dozens and we're looking at a few points so brethren this year wherever it is that you may be gathered together to celebrate the national holiday of thanksgiving 
I think, I, I hope that I've made it clear we should be doing this at all times. This is this constantly on our thinking. Yes, and I do mean constantly on our thinking of giving praise and thanks for God for all that he has done. And at various times, we can come up with various things to be thankful for. But the nation has set aside a day, and we can honor that. There's not a problem with that. So wherever we gathered on this day, this national holiday of Thanksgiving, I ask that we all remember to celebrate, to give thanks for, praising God for, the greatest gift of all. And we mentioned it, and that is salvation through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we do this by praising him and offering up true appreciation and thankfulness. And we do this for all that he has done. We do this for all that he is doing today for us and for everyone else that we know and for all that he is yet to do for all of us. Thankfulness is not just an interesting little topic that we can focus on once a year because of Thanksgiving. This is a topic we should be they would be focused on in our own mind and in our own heart and in our prayers daily, every day. And again, we ask, why would we not? Thankfulness is really the heart of Jesus Christ and the mind of Jesus Christ. And we read earlier, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Thankfulness. The ironic blessing, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his son, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Happy Sabbath, happy holiday coming up this week. Be safe and be thankful. We love you.